Well, good morning, church. I hope that you guys are having a fantastic Sunday. Uh, I know that I am. I'm super excited to not only bring you God's word, but also to uh, kind of guide you through this today. All right. So today we are going to continue our series through the book of Revelation. But before we do that, as I always tell you guys, I want you to do three main things. Number one, make sure that you have some sort of Bible with you. OK, so you always want to read along with us as we're going through God's word. Um, to, uh, today, I am reading through the Christian Standard uh, Version Bible. So if by chance you've ever actually asked yourself, like, what translation is this pastor reading? There you go. Now you have the translation, but you can use whatever Bible you have. Make sure that you open it up to the last book of the Bible, and that is the book of Revelation, right? Second thing that you want to do, you want to make sure that you have some sort of uh, pencil, pen, uh, tablet, or a pad of paper, uh, if we still remember what those things are, basically to document. Maybe it's your journal. Write down what God is speaking to you, or write down maybe a question that you have. Maybe a doubt that you have, maybe just something, something that kind of rings a bell and you want to revisit it. Why? Because many, many, many times whenever we have those moments, that's when the Holy Spirit is bringing something to our attention. So again, I want to encourage you, make sure you have something to write those ideas down. Thirdly, get comfortable. The only reason why I say this time and time again, I'm not asking you to be lazy. I'm asking you to be comfortable. And what comfortable means is uh, we are not here to perform. We are not here to be a show. We are not a spectacle for God. In fact, throughout this entire book, when you read it, nobody uh, is trying to impress God. God shows up in people's lives as they are. He only ever actually does things with real people when they are real. If you'll notice, 99% of the time when God has a conflict with someone, it's because they are pretending. They are trying to show off or show their best when, in fact, God is saying, I'm not interested in the show. I'm interested in you. So that's why I say if you are uncomfortable right now or if there's something going on before you watch this video, make sure that you are comfortable, that the real you is present and let God in, uh, work, mold, shape who you are. All right. Now, uh, I do want to share with you guys kind of a, a, a kind of a heads up. And that is we are about to run into Revelation chapter 11. And when I do have to preface it by saying According to every commentator, every person that has taken the time to study scripture uh, on an on a exegetical level, on a theological level, on a um, um, scholarly level is what I'm saying, is, is has run up to chapter 11. And they have a lot of moments where they want to like tear the hair out of their head because they're like, oh, is this so difficult to interpret? I do want to say, yes, is it difficult? It is very difficult. And I'll explain why. It's difficult because of the fact that uh, we are seeing a lot of symbolism, a whole lot of Old Testament references. We are going to see a lot of um, imagery that not necessarily that we're trying to figure out the exact interpretation. Rather, we're trying to look at this and go, does it mean this? Does it mean this? Does it mean this? Not too long ago, I had the wondrous pleasure of having uh, car trouble. Now, if, if you guys have ever had car trouble, there are, there are two levels to every situation concerning your vehicle. Number one, you have the issue of the vehicle itself. So let's say your car won't turn over. Let's say that it makes a funny sound. Let's say that it's squealing. Let's say that whenever you turn the wheel, it doesn't go the right direction. Whatever the case is, that's one problem. The second problem is whether you have the tools to fix the first problem. Okay, so <laughs> same thing with plumbing. You're always going to have an issue, and then you're going to find out whether you have the skills and abilities and tools to deal with said issue. Not too long ago with my wondrous vehicle that I have, uh, it decided to no longer turn on. Like uh, you would turn the key, nothing, no electrical would turn on, but just a few days ago, it was running totally fine. So uh, a, a friend of ours here at the church, he decided to you know, give us his time and he said, hey, don't worry about it. Like we'll do this together. He had the tools necessary, right? So he shows up to my car and starts pulling things, you know, out of the way. We try to get to this thing called an alternator. You probably already know what that is. He returns the juice back to the battery, giving it um, a full charge while you're driving your car, right? We thought that was the culprit. How funny would it have been if my friend who was helping me on my vehicle, I handed him my tools and that actually that wouldn't be accurate. Do I have tools? I do. But what if I handed him my kids tools? Like straight up play school, we're talking John Deere, little plastic, like wrench and socket and be like, here you go. What do you think he would do? He would probably look at me and go, what do you want me to do with that? Like we are dealing with real life issues here and you're handing me baby tools, like kid tools. That, that 
We're going to get nowhere. That's the best explanation that I can give as to why when we are looking at Revelation chapter 11, we have such issues. Is because to some degree we have, um, to use the term, putting a square peg in a round hole. There are scholars and there are, are people that probably with the greatest intent have looked at chapter 11 and have tried their hardest to place a theology upon it that would uh, suit them or maybe that they felt most comfortable or maybe in their studies, this is the, the conclusion they came to. But chapter 11 is one of those chapters where if you're going to have one of those square pegs in a round hole, if you're going to say, here's my theology and I'm going to shove it somewhere so that it makes sense, chapter 11 is that section that goes, it's just not going to fly, man. It's just, just, just stop. Like you are shoving the square peg as hard as you can. You're now breaking the plastic, trying to put it in the round hole. And what I mean by that is that there are uh, and I think I've, I've had the opportunity to share with you guys. There are different theologies that people come away uh, from reading Revelation. There are those that believe, for example, that the, the, the church is, isn't going to be picked up until the last possible moment. There are those who believe that the church is picked up right at the beginning of the book. There are those who believe that the church will be picked up halfway through the tribulation. So that, you know, three and a half years in of the seven years. Uh, there are those that believe that Jesus is going to come and reign literally for a thousand years. There are those that believe that's not till the end. That's once everything is put away, everything's put back on in the box and on the shelf. There are those that believe, <laughs> on and on and on the list goes. I'm, I'm not kidding you guys. There there are, are millennials, premillennials, postmillennials. There's amillennials. There, there are on and on and on the list goes. What I am saying is that if you're one of those fill in the blank alienists or whatever, <laughs> pre, post, during, if your theology, and I want to take a step back and say not just in this circumstance, but if your theology feels like a square peg in a round hole, I want you all who are listening, including pastors, leaders, uh, churchgoers, uh, 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 disciples that have nothing to do with church, but you're doing this on your own, anybody, Anybody whatsoever who is following God on their own two feet, if your view of God or if your understanding of God rubs up against the sandpaper of Scripture at some point and your theology isn't going to make it through, then this would be a phenomenal time to drop that theology. We cannot force our ideas upon Scripture. And I have to say that very clearly. And you probably are like, I feel like I already watched this sermon. Johnny, you just said that a few sermons ago. Yes. And I will repeat myself time and time again, because what I keep running into are pastors, leaders, uh, uh, small group leaders, random Christians, um, um, anyone really within the faith who end up saying, hey, here's what I believe. And I go, yeah, but what about like if you look at the whole of Scripture, your idea here doesn't make sense. And they go, it, it's just it, it, that's wrong. I'm right. No. And that's 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 a very much no no if that if, if I can say that respectfully respectfully um, <laughs> what I mean is that let's go through chapter eleven I'll explain the different theories and then you'll understand why ah it just doesn't work right and if it doesn't work we have to leave it alone and embrace what does work okay so you are going to be turning your Bibles to chapter eleven we'll read it as a whole and then we'll take it little by little right. So we have chapter 11, and it says this. Then I was given a measuring rod, uh, or sorry, a measuring reed like a rod, with these words, go and measure the temple of God and the altar, and count those who worship there. They, but exclude the courtyard outside the temple. Don't measure it, because it is given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for a hundred years, or sorry, 1,260 days dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. They also have the power over the water to turn, <coughs> excuse me, to turn, in, turn it into blood and to strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. 
When they finish their testimony, the beast that comes out of the abyss will make their war on them, conquer them, and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the main street of the great city, which figuratively is called Sodom in Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. And some of the people, tribes, languages, and nations will view their bodies for three and a half days and not permit their bodies to be put into a tomb. Those who live on the earth will gloat over them and celebrate and send gifts to one another because these two prophets have tormented those who live on the earth. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. They went up to heaven in a cloud and while their enemies watched them, and at that moment, a violent earthquake took place. A tenth of the city fell and 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven, which we'll get to that in a little second. The second woe has passed. Take note, the third woe is coming soon. The seventh angel blew his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world is, has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell face down and worshiped God saying, We give thanks, Lord God, the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to the servants, the prophets, to the saints and those who fear your name both small and great, and the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, an earthquake and severe hail. So what is going on in this chapter 11? Why do so many commentators say it's so difficult to interpret? The difficulty in interpreting has to do with two different things, and that is, the symbolism that we see. So if you guys, as you guys were reading through and reading with me, you notice that there were certain references. There are two witnesses that end up showing up, right? Those two witnesses are clothed in sackcloth. When they want to fight back from those who are trying to attack them, they breathe fire out of their mouth, ultimately burning the person that they're dealing with. They can stop the rain if they wanted to. They could even make water into blood, which is similar to the plagues that have happened before, and also the plague of Egypt, which is part of what we're going to talk about. And these two witnesses eventually are prophesying. They are testifying. They are telling of the message of Christ. And people are listening, but there doesn't seem to be a response until eventually the beast that comes from the abyss, you guessed it, this is what we, we call the Antichrist, but we will eventually get to the actual title that is in scripture, right? But this beast that comes from the abyss ends up attacking them and yes, actually takes their lives. As a result, they die. Three days pass. The whole world is excited because they're like, done with that. Well, nobody liked them anyway. And we'll talk about how that's going to happen. And then three days later, they come back to life. And they hear a voice from heaven saying, come up here. Which again, I wonder where we've heard that before. And then this, they're caught up in a cloud. They are removed from the earth. They go back to heaven. And at that moment, there's an earthquake that shakes the city that they're in, ends up killing 7,000 people, and a tenth of the city falls into ruins. Once that happens, then we hear the seventh trumpet, which means we are still in that interlude that we started last week. As the seventh trumpet is blown, all of a sudden, all of heaven is in an uproar, saying, the kingdom of this earth is no longer. It is now the kingdom of heaven and of, of, of God and his Christ, which is the title that they, they throw out there. And then they just start rejoicing, saying, look, God is going to call the dead. He's going to judge humanity. He is going to reward the saints and the prophets and every single person that has feared the name of the Lord. And as soon as that is declared, all of a sudden, all these plagues begin to happen again, you know, with, with the stuff that we... And what's going to happen in chapter 12? Well, why don't we go backwards on this tape and start off at the beginning and say, what exactly is going on? And where do we find issues? So as we begin to read chapter 11, it says, then it was given a, a measuring rod, right? This measuring rod is a reed that is very common within the area of Jerusalem. 
by the way, they can get as tall as 10 feet if they're allowed to grow that tall. However, these reeds were normally used to measure something. So, for example, let's say you were like, hey, can I have a yard of this? You would go, uh, uh, hold on. They would go over to any water area, probably find these reeds, pluck one out, come over, and then cut it to the distance that they were trying to measure. And now you have a measuring stick. Now you can say, oh, it's this big, right? Great. John is given, what's interesting is that John normally doesn't participate with the revelation that he's receiving, but previously he's been asked to be part of it. And this is another circumstance where God is telling him, you're going to participate. So he says here, John, I'm giving you a reed that is made for measuring, which we'll get to what up with these measurements, right? And he was told these words, looking at verse one, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and the court of uh, those who worship there, but exclude the courtyard outside the temple. Do not measure it because it is given to the nations. Then they will trample the holy city for 42 months. I will, well, we'll stop right there. So what is happening? One, the question is, what temple is he measuring? So first off, John is given a read. He goes around measuring the temple, the altar, and the surrounding courtyard, but not the outer courtyard. Why? This has to go, we have to go back into time and history. First off, how many temples have there been? Two, okay? The first one being dreamed up by, by King David. When he conquered Jerusalem, he said, I want to establish a house for God, a permanent house, not the tabernacle anymore. So he comes up with this beautiful, elaborate idea, but he has to get all the funds together. He gets them together, but David passes. It eventually becomes the responsibility of his son, Solomon. Solomon takes all the resources, builds a temple, by the way, we have never till this day seen a temple that looked like that. It was so beautiful and so decorated in gold that you could literally be walking up near Jerusalem and from a distance see the glimmering light of, the, of these golden grapes that were gigantic, by the way, that were hanging on top of the temple that you would see that glimmer from miles away. It was beautiful. However, what ends up happening? If you guys read in Daniel, Daniel is told... That King Nebuchadnezzar, although previous prophets such as Jeremiah warned Israel, said, if you guys don't knock it off, there's this nation that's going to come from the north and is going to attack us and take us. That was the one and only uh, Babylon, also known as King Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, Daniel tells us, kings come over, well, the king destroys that temple. I mean, just flattens it, takes all the people from Jerusalem, eventually takes them over to the desert, right? They stay there for forever and a day, and then they return. But when they return, they decide to build a second temple, which takes a little bit more time. Unfortunately, it's not the same size. It's not the same glamour. It's not the same beauty. So we have the second temple, which a lot of times, if you guys do your study of scripture, you'll hear the term second temple Judaism. Second temple meaning the second temple that has been around. However, that temple ends up being destroyed in 70 AD as a result of the Romans, trying to blame the Christians, and <laughs> they just burn it to the ground. So here's the first issue. What temple is this? Okay, If this book of Revelation was written earlier, earlier than 70 AD, then you could make the argument in saying this is the temple that you would have seen, but eventually does get destroyed. But if that were the case, and that means that most of these events would have already happened, and guess what? We're still here. So I don't think any of these events have happened. Now that we can clear that theology out of the way, is it possible that there's going to be a third temple? Well, I will tell you that in Jerusalem, there is the Temple Institute, which is an a organization that has a desire to rebuild the temple. But there's a lot of issues with that. Number one is that some people say that's a bad idea well, because the, the area right now is run by Muslims. So the chances of them actually building probably never going to happen. Not impossible, just probably not going to happen anytime soon. And there's a lot of theories on how that can happen, which I'm not going to go into. The case is there is, because this book was written probably in 90 uh, uh, A.D., then this second temple has already been destroyed. So there's obviously another temple. And we are looking at a physical temple here on earth, a Jewish temple here on earth. Why do I bring that up? Because we are about to run into another theory, another theology that says this, all of this chapter 11 has to do with the church. 
Number one, the church hasn't been mentioned for chapters ago. Number two, square peg round hole. It just doesn't work out. When we start to look at the two witnesses, when we start to look at um, the city itself, when we start to understand the descriptions of the city, understanding that there's an altar, understanding that there's a temple, understanding that there's an outer court and an inner court, the fact that the outer court is run by the Gentiles. All of this is Judaism. All of this is Old Testament. And when we get to the two prophets, all of that screams prophets from the Old Testament. Why do I bring that up? Because for us to square peg this thing and shoving our theology saying, it's the church, it just does not work out in the end. The pieces don't fit. So I'm sorry if you're one of those that says, I believe that this is the church. Well, then uh, I hope you have a trash can near you. And I want you to grab that theology and boop, embrace it for what it is. I think what's driving our desire to make this story about the church is because we think, and I say this as respectfully, angrily, frustratedly, those are even words, as I can. God has not abandoned Israel. It doesn't make sense for you to have over 75% of this story, your entire Old Testament, to be about Israel and Judaism, and all of a sudden... The New Testament just throws Judaism out the window. Understand this. The Jewish leaders of Jesus' day, he had frustrations with. But not the Jewish people per se. They were lost because their leaders were idiots. Oh, was that offensive? Hey, the same thing can happen today. We can have idiots in the position of church leaders. And what that'll do is that'll form idiot-driven theologies and then we find ourselves scratching our heads because I really don't have any idea what I believe or what I doubt or even what I doubt or what I believe. And we're stuck. And then as Christians, we get surprised left and right by human events going, well, I don't know. My Bible doesn't tell me. Actually, it did. But you had a poor, educated leader. A person that wasn't interested in God, but more interested in fame, glory, or power. And that is how we end up where we end up today. Church, yes, we play a role in the salvation message, but Israel wasn't replaced. Okay? We were adopted. Can you say that with me? Adopted. It is literally in your Bible. It says we have now been adopted into the family of God, which means adoption doesn't mean you get rid of your legitimate children. You are adopting more children and you keep the originals. Now that I've clarified that, here's what's going on. Verse 3, I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for a hundred or 1,260 days dressed in sackcloth. Keep reading because it'll, these two olive trees and the two, <laughs> and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed this way. They have authority to close up the sky so that it does not rain during the days of their prophecy. And they also have the power to uh, uh, power over the water to turn them into blood and strike the earth with every plague whenever they want. What are the theories on this one? These two people are one symbols so they're not even literal people but they're symbols of the old testament and the new testament why does that not make sense why would the old or new testament be breathing out fire and calling down plagues just for funsies it doesn't go with older new testament some people go this is the church the church's job is to witness to everybody and 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 you know and all that and the temple is actually the church again doesn't make sense why would that happen especially since what we're being described is jerusalem and the temple Folks, this is all Jewish language, and we need to leave it as Jewish language. Why? Because these two prophets, if they were the church witnessing, then are you telling me that the church universal is going to all die as a martyr? Because that's what they did. And then came back to life and went to heaven. Again, the church has not been mentioned for several, several chapters. So why mention it now? Again, if that's your theology, find a reciprocal file. Drop it there. Leave it as Jerusalem, okay? It just makes more sense. 
Believe it as Judaism, it just makes more sense. These two witnesses can breathe fire. They can call down plagues. They can do all of these things. Now think, 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 think. Where does this come from? Ah, there are some theories that say this has to be two people, right? And that is Enoch and Elijah. Why? Because neither one of these men in the Old Testament saw death. Therefore, they are the two that are totally going to show up. Cool theory. Way to go. This is actually the theory of Irenaeus and some other, uh, you know, really, really, really uh, old theologians, which we all respect and love. However, I, I don't know if that necessarily, it's one of those, hey, totally possible, totally possible. What would make more sense, though? If you guys remember, on in the New Testament within the Gospels, we are told that there's a very special moment between Jesus and and three of his disciples, which would be John, James, and Peter. These three are hanging out with him on a very private hill, otherwise known as the Mount Transfiguration. On this mountain of transfiguration, Jesus is speaking to two people that appear before him, and they're having a conversation, and we're not told that that conversation is. But as Peter starts to utter, like a dummy, the, a cloud envelops them, all three, Jesus, these two, um, and then this voice comes forward that says, Peter, this is my son. Listen to him. In other words, stop talking and listen to my son, right? As we hear that, who are the two figures? Moses and Elijah. Wow. So why Moses and Elijah? Because Moses represents the law and Elijah represents the prophets. However, the symbolism of being two olive branches and also being lampstands, although in the Old Testament it's only one lampstand, comes from Zechariah. If we look at the prophet Zechariah, I want to say it's chapter 4, we are told that that the, these symbols exist, but these symbols represent two other figures. Joshua, who is a priest, and Zerubbabel, which is a, a prince. Again, not impossible, but it's one of those, there's so much Old Testament figure you know language that is going on here that it's just silly for us to assume it's the church and rather it's safest to assume that this is judaism this this is the old testament prophets and and, and all of that merging into this beautiful last moment that we see because the seventh trumpet is what is about to be uh blown what ends up happening well we are told that these two witnesses end up losing their lives as a result of, of the beast coming forward. Now, how does this beast come out of the abyss and become in power? If you remember, the world is in chaos now. The world is almost destroyed. It's very interesting, again, if history repeats itself, how did, how did Adolf Hitler come into power in Germany? Germany was left in ruins after World War I. So you have a group of people that literally are just trying to get a morsel of bread and a cup of water and a leader shows up and says, I can fix it all. What would you do? You would vote that guy in, but you don't know his intentions. That doesn't matter. He's taking care of our problems. That is how Adolf Hitler came into power. He showed himself as a hero to a people that were desperate for a hero. And the rest of the world suffered. This man of lawlessness, a.k.a. the Antichrist, shows up out of the abyss and destroys the two witnesses. And the world is excited. They are in an uproar going, praise the Lord. Not praise the Lord. They are excited just going, yeah, we're awesome. We're, that was, oh, you know, that's so cool. You got rid of them. Why? Because these two people, literal people, were prophesying, saying, hey, we are here to tell you that the story of Jesus is true. But this man of lawlessness comes over and finally kills them. And they lay there in the streets for three days. And there is such a rejoicing going on amongst the world that they're sending gifts to one another because they're like, I'm sending you a present because I'm so excited. These guys are dead. Like we don't have to listen to them anymore. But three days later, something unheard of happens. First off, how in the world, if you could go back a few generations, they would probably ask the same question we're asking now. How can you, how can you have two witnesses in Jerusalem and the whole world be watching today? That is possible because of what you're holding right now. You might be watching this video on your phone or it's on a TV. Both are the answer. TV allows you to see live events around the world today. And your phone makes it accessible for you to be anywhere and watch exactly what is going on in our world. Two witnesses killed, boom, on the phone. They come back to life after three days 
everyone sees it on their phone. What's interesting is this. I want you to keep reading verse 11. But after three and a half days, the breath of life, which is a reference to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2 and creating Adam, right? The breath of life of God, the ruh of God, uh, enters them and they stood on their feet. Great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to, to them, come up here. They went up to the heavens in a cloud, and there their enemies watched them. And at that moment, a violent earthquake took place. A tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed in that earthquake. The survivors were terrified and gave glory to God of heaven. Nowhere up to this point have we ever seen a human response to God in the form of repentance. Literally, the world has been overrun by demons. Uh, the, the, the planet is collapsing. Like we have volcanoes going, waters turning into blood, things are poisonous, radiations everywhere. And nowhere does humanity go, you know what? I give up. God, you're in charge. No, nowhere until now. And as soon as this happens, now we get into the seventh trumpet. It is blown, and then what ends up happening is a little confusing. Again, why it's so hard to interpret. The reason why it's so confusing is because we are being given a snapshot of what is yet to come. The hallelujah, the amen, the Jesus is now in control. Jesus is now ruling and reigning, and he has his kingdom, and he has his church, and he has his saints, and he has the Old Testament prophets. Everyone's receiving the reward, and he's calling a judgment on all of humanity. Everyone, right? We look at this going, so this is the end? We're done? Not necessarily. There are two options here. Either one, this is the end. Maybe it's the end of the outside of the scroll. Remember when the lamb was opening the scroll? There was writing on the outside, and there's writing on the inside. Is this the end of the outside writing? Option one. Or two. Did we just experience the, the, the macro version of the tribulation? And from here until chapter 19, we're going to go into the micro version, meaning the detail, looking at it under a microscope. We're going to see everything happen again, but this time in full detail. Most scholars would agree that it's the second option. But here's what I want you to go home with. So we see these two witnesses, right? And they're prophesying. They're telling people, hey, I'm telling you the story of Jesus. I'm telling you the story of Jesus. Repent, repent, repent. A word that we do not like to hear, let alone in the world. We're getting to the point where we don't want to hear it in churches. It's a scary, scary place to be. But here's my question to you. What is it going to take? If you notice, I mentioned that we have seen volcanic eruptions we have seen the sea and the sea creatures get poisoned and die we have seen rivers turn into poison we have seen the sky turn black the moon turn black we have seen stars fall from the heavens we have seen demons come out of the abyss we have seen demonic superpowers come out of the abyss we have seen satan fall from heaven we have seen uh humanity try to destroy itself through nuclear holocaust You look at this and you would probably say, before any of this happened, I would give up and say, God, I'm, I'm done. I'm sorry. Uh, forgive me. I'm repenting. But I want you to ask the honest question, taking it back to the Old Testament, Psalm 139, where David says, will you do me a favor and look at my heart? Is there something in there that offends me? God, is there something about me that's not functioning? Is there something in me that is not bringing your holiness to light? Is there something about my soul that is so out of whack? I need you to reveal it to me, and then I need your help. Because your Holy Spirit is the only one that can change that in me. Genuine repentance. Mind you, I'm not here to tell you that you need to live a sinless life. Because nobody can pull that off, including the guy talking to you. I'm not asking for perfection. Christ is the only perfection. But we are following perfection. Which means that my level of holiness has to grow. But it can only grow based upon my level of intimacy with God. And my willingness to not always be the right. In the right. Meaning, 
some of us, it's funny that we will talk about sins all day. We'll talk about the drinking, smoking, sexual morality, like all of this stuff. We'll never talk about pride. Some, some of us have the incessant, uncontrollable desire to always be right. Some of us, and, and I'll share this actually, meaning I, I remember once being part of a church where um, there was a gentleman who, who, you know, did a lot of like the um, digital stuff. So he like did the online service or the website, or he was in charge of, uh, video recording and, and and sound and all this stuff. He was, for lack of a better word, like probably the biggest jerk I've ever met in my life. And what was sad was nobody, nobody ever came to him and said, hey, you know, you don't have to be this mean all the time. Like Christ has given us a heart that is tender and gentle. And sure, there are times where we have to be direct, and but we don't always have to be mean. And what's funny is this gentleman and the people that I talked to all told me the same thing. This is who I am. Stop being a baby. They would look and go, yeah, that's just who he is. Like, it's fine. It's not. That's a, that's a pride issue. That's, that's his need to have to be the big guy or the bully or whatever the case is. And I thought that's so weird that that's fine. But we'll get really mad at someone for like stealing a candy bar. You know what I mean? The question is, how far? Like, how bad do things have to get for us to finally go, you know what, God, I don't, I need you to, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. I'm sorry, and I don't, I don't want to continue in this pattern. I want you to form in me a new heart, a desire, a greater desire for you, for, for your word, for holiness, for love, for kindness, for forgiveness, for for uh, generosity, for the things that God is trying to form and instill within us, that we are willing to go, I, I, I'm okay letting go of these things. Even if it's bad theology, I'm okay with letting go of these things because God, I want you to form me into the likeness of your son, whatever that looks like. And we have an image of the son in our work. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. The same message that Jesus had. And my prayer for you today is that you would find a quiet place, be honest with God, and say, God, help me, help me repent today. Grace and peace be with you. This is the way. Love you guys.